Hi, welcome to Art for All, the Sketchbook School podcast. I'm your host, Danny Gregory, and each week I bring you a story, a conversation, an idea, something to keep you stimulated while you work on your own creative project. At Sketchbook School, we don't just teach people to draw and paint. We teach them how to be creative, to think in new and different ways, to have confidence in their creative abilities, to see like artists, to support other creative people in a sprawling community of artists, not just to draw, but to love to draw and create, to change their lives. It happens every day and to tens of thousands of folks all over the world. We teach art by asking working artists to teach it, and different artists every week. A different experience, a different way of seeing. If this sort of experience sounds intriguing, please take a free sample course. You can sign up at our website, sketchbook.school. We'd love to have you join our community and share your own ideas with us. This purpose and approach has inspired what I want to talk about in this week's episode. It's about learning and creativity and risk-taking I hope it stimulates some thoughts while you create. A couple of years ago, I wrote an essay about art education on my blog. It got a fair amount of response. I think it's a very important subject to discuss, whether you're a child, a parent, or just a member of society thinking about the future of our species. I'd like to share the piece with you and then talk about how to take the discussion even further. I wrote this essay after being invited to do some brief art residencies in various international schools. I worked with art teachers and their students, children from the ages of 3 up to 18, that's pre-K to 12th grade, in New York, in Basel, Prague, Qatar, Beijing, Kuala Lumpur, Vietnam, and other places around the world. I spent a lot of time in the classroom experiencing how students feel about studying and making art. I combined those observations with what I was thinking about the changes that have been going on in the adult world, changes in business and technology and creativity. And then I added a few of my own memories from school way back in the 20th century. This piece is called Let's Get Rid of Art Education, A Modest Proposal. And it's a shocking title, as intended, And the subtitle is a reference to social satirists like Jonathan Swift, who advocated that the Irish poor eat their own children to offset famine. By satirizing an extreme position, I hope to make people think again about some time-honored conventions. Here's the piece that I wrote. Art, they say, is great for kids. Art and music programs help keep them in school, make them more committed, enhance collaboration, strengthen ties to the community and to peers, improve motor and spatial and language skills. A study by the College Board showed that students who took four years of art scored 91 points better on the SAT exams. At-risk students who take art are significantly more likely to stay in school and ultimately to get college degrees. Awesome. Nonetheless, arts education has been gutted in American public schools. A decade ago, the No Children Left Behind and Common Core programs prioritized science and math over other subjects. In L.A. County alone, one-third of the arts teachers were let go between 2008 and 2012. And for half of K-5 through students, art was cut altogether. After the recession of 2008, 80% of schools had their budget cut further. Art programs were the first victims. And predictably, lower income and minority students were the most likely to lose their art programs. Only 26.2% of African American students have access to art classes. As the economy improved, there was some discussion about reversing some of these cuts, but it's not enough. I'm no expert on education but I've spent a lot of time in school art programs over the past couple of years, watching how children create. In the lower grades, kids just have fun drawing and painting. They don't really need much encouragement or instruction. In middle school, 
the majority start to lose their passion for making stuff. And they begin to learn the price of making mistakes. Our class is all too often a gut, an opportunity for adolescents to screw around. By high school, they've been divided into a handful who are artsy and may go on to art school, and a vast majority who have no interest in art at all. In short, every child starts out with a natural interest in art, which is slowly drained away, until all that's left is a handful of teens in eyeliner and black clothing whose parents worry they'll never move out of the basement. Here's a modest proposal. Let's take the art out of art education. Art is not respected in this country. It's seen as frivolity, an indulgence, a way to keep kids busy with scissors and paste. Art is viewed as an elitist luxury that hard-nosed bureaucrats know that they can cut with impunity. And so they do, making math and science the priority to fill the ranks of future bean counters and pencil pushers. So I propose we get rid of art education and replace it with something that is crucial to the future of our world, creativity. We need to all be creative in ways that we could never be before. We have so many wonderful tools that put the power of creation into our hands, and we use them every day. Solving problems, using tools, collaborating, expressing our ideas clearly, being entrepreneurial and resourceful. These are the skills that will matter in the 21st century post-corporate labor market. Instead of being defensive about art, instead of talking about culture and self-expression, we have to focus on the power of creativity and the skills required to develop it. A great artist is also a problem solver, a presenter, an entrepreneur, a fabricator, and much more. Imagine if creativity became a part of our core education. Instead of teaching kids to paint bowls of fruit with tempera, we'd show them how to communicate a concept through a sketch, how to explore the world in a sketchbook, how to generate ideas, how to solve real problems. Theater would be all about collaboration, presentation, and problem solving. Music classes would emphasize creative habit, teamwork, honing skills, composition, improvisation. We teach creative process, how to come up with ideas, how to find inspiration, how to steal from the greats. We teach kids to work effectively with others to improve and test their ideas. We teach them how to realize their ideas, get them executed through a supply chain, how to present and market and share them. We'd also emphasize digital creativity, focusing on cutting edge and cheap technology, removing the artificial divide between arts and science, showing how engineering and sculpture are related, how drawing and user experience, UX design, are facets of the same sort of skills, how music and math mirror each other. We teach kids how to use Photoshop to communicate concepts, to shoot and cut videos, to design presentations, to use social media intelligently, to write clearly because it's key to survival. We'd give kids destined for a minimum wage jobs a chance to be entrepreneurial, to create true economic power for themselves by developing their creativity and seeing opportunity in a whole new way. Yes, I know there are high school video classes and art computer labs, but they need to be turned into engines for creativity and usefulness, not abstract, highfalutin artsiness based on some 1970s concept of self-expression. Don't make black and white films about leaves reflected in puddles. Make a video to promote adoption at the local animal shelter. Don't do laborious charcoal drawings of pop stars. Generate ideas on paper. 
Fill 100 post-its with 100 doodles of ways to raise consciousness about the environment or income inequality or saving water. Stop making pinch pots and build a 3D printer and turn out artificial hands for homeless amputees. And by the way, if we teach kids lots of math and science but don't encourage their creativity, they aren't going to grow up to be great engineers and scientists and inventors and discoverers, just drones and dorks. Creativity is not a ghetto. It's not a clique. It's not something to be exercised alone in a garret. It's also not a freak show of self-indulgent divas and losers. Creativity is about helping to solve the world's many problems. We need to make sure that the kids of today, who will need to be the creative problem solvers of tomorrow, realize their creative potential and have the tools to use them. That matters far more than football teams and standardized test scores. What do you think? Tens of thousands of people read this essay, and hundreds posted comments on it. A magazine asked permission to reprint it in their next issue. Some readers congratulated me on the piece. Many told me I was an evil monster for having written it. Some of them were art teachers, just about my favorite people in the world. They do a hard and essential job, and they do it all too often without proper acknowledgement and support. I also heard from a lot of school children who love art, and many of them disagreed with me, often quite passionately. It was sort of an odd place for me to find myself. I mean, I love art, too, and I hadn't intended my piece to do anything but advance the cause of art and creativity rather than cause real controversy and consternation. So let me begin to respond by answering my own question and telling you what I think about what I thought. First, I think I was probably a little reductionist and insulting in the name of satire. When I feel strongly about something, I unfortunately tend to do that. It's an unattractive quality, and it's presumably what set off the people who wrote to me that say that I was an idiot or worse. I accept that. But I still believe that my thesis has merit. If pinheaded bureaucrats have a problem with quote-unquote art and insist on slashing budgets, then let's not call it that. If they think that art classes are just self-indulgent wastes of resources, well, there's no point arguing any more about culture and civilization and lofty things like that. It's just not practical. Even though it's been clearly proven to improve young minds, when you talk about artists, narrow-minded people who probably didn't take enough art classes themselves, see red. They see some sort of communist, godless, elitist conspiracy, and the discussion ends quickly to the sounds of checkbook slamming closed. So maybe changing team uniforms wouldn't be such a bad thing. And secondly, if creativity is a huge buzzword in business circles, couldn't we hop on the bandwagon? The fact is, creativity is just another way of talking about problem solving. And in a changing world full of new problems, any smart CEO wants idea people. When I graduated and began working, the path was from college to the mailroom or a training program, and then the inexorable climb up the corporate ladder. That was just what you did to get ahead in the 20th century. But there aren't any mailrooms anymore, and training programs have been shelved, and no smart 22-year-old expects to start at the bottom of some big corporation and patiently climb their way up to a pension after 40 years. Them days are long gone. The ever-changing world that technology has wrought means that there are no guarantees, no safety, just whatever you make of the opportunities that pop up. You need to keep your eyes open. You need to be resourceful. You need to adapt to change. You need to collaborate. You need to think fresh thoughts. And you need to accept that education doesn't end with a cap and gown. It's a lifelong pursuit for anyone with an interest in surviving. Do school curricula prepare kids for that new playing field? Again, I'm no expert, so please feel free to set me straight if you're a teacher or a school administrator. But from what I've seen, the curriculum of most American schools hasn't really changed an awful lot for an awful long time. That's not the fault of teachers who constantly deny the resources they would need to revise what students are taught. So instead, kids find ways to teach themselves. They pick up technology on their own. They watch YouTube videos. They make YouTube videos. They share what they learn with each other. They develop many of the tools they'll need on their own. Their parents and their teachers can't really help them because they're usually several steps behind on the leading tech edge. 
I'm not just talking about teaching kids tech skills. That they can pick up or learn in college or even at work. And any technology lessons will need to be refreshed every six months anyway. What matters isn't just the information or the knowledge. Instead, it's the basic human skills. The skills you need to teach yourself in a world where learning never stops. How to solve problems. How to explore the world. How to imagine and invent. How to make the new. What I think would be interesting to explore is to teach the essentials of the creative process and make it a part of the core that all kids learn, whether they're going to go on to be artists or designers or engineers or doctors or farmers. So next, I'd like to sketch out in a bit more detail what I think some of those lessons could be. First of all, I'd encourage kids to come up with ideas, lots and lots of ideas. I'd say start each day by writing down a list of 10 new ideas. They can be on any subject. 10 ideas for songs by your favorite band. 10 ideas for why the Civil War happened. 10 ideas to reinvent sneaker design. 10 ideas for new video games. It doesn't matter if they're good or bad. Just write down 10 every day. And the next day, pick a different topic and write down 10 more ideas. Do it every school day, and by the end of the year, you'll have 2,500 new ideas. Most will suck. One or two will certainly be gangbusters. The next year, do it again. There's so much power in developing this habit of regular, self-guided, sustained creativity. Thinking of so many ideas teaches another important lesson, that it's perfectly okay to have bad ideas. It's okay to make mistakes. Every kid knows that lesson, but school rarely emphasizes it. How do you get good at playing a video game? You try stuff out, you die, you get respawned, and you try something else. That's a basic creative skill. But it's light years away from the idea of final exams and pop quizzes and standardized tests. What if we encourage kids to get stuff wrong to see what happens? What would happen? Next, let's actively encourage collaboration and teach kids the tools for doing it better. When people work together in teams, they come up with stuff that individuals never could. But there are skills involved in collaboration. You need to learn to work together. You need to build trust. You need to recognize and honor different skill sets, different aptitudes, different perspectives and tastes. What if we made those lessons explicit? What if we studied how successful teams work and emulate them, try different styles, try different approaches? What if we made school less about competition on the sports field, in the college application process, in grading, and instead championed working together? And off the top of my head, here are a few other topics that might be interesting to explore. It ain't all about talent. Instead, let's emphasize the pleasures and rewards of craft, skill, hard work, and perseverance. What are creative blocks, and how do you get past them? The roles and rewards of analog and digital technology in the creative process. How to be conscious, not self-conscious. That's especially helpful for teenagers. How to take risks without being terrified of failure how and why to make mistakes, how to embrace the strange. The real lives of real artists, historical and contemporary. What do Leonardo da Vinci and Kendrick Lamar have in common? Make it exciting and relevant. How to have a creative career. You don't need to starve or be a zillionaire, but you do need to learn some basic pr principles of entrepreneurship and self-promotion. How to think creatively no matter your job. You don't have to be a professional artist to use your imagination. What if we explored how scientists or policemen or chefs or historians use their creative abilities? How to be an independent thinker, an individual, and it doesn't require a nose ring. What the inner critic is and how to work with it. Specializing and not specializing, the pleasures of being a creative dilettante and of being a skilled craftsman. Productivity yields results. Throw stuff at the wall, 
the more the merrier until something sticks. Time management. How to find opportunities to create and produce and think, no matter how busy you are. The legitimate and scientifically verified benefits of staring out the window and how to get school credit for doing it. How to analyze your personal thought and creation process and recognize your strengths and weaknesses to make more better stuff. Well, that's just my list of this morning's ideas. Young minds could certainly crank out way more. What if we taught students, specifically and explicitly, what the creative process is? How ideas come about? The working of the mind and the imagination. Best practices. It's not a huge mystery, you know. Creativity is a messy process. Scientists call it entropy. It comes from taking different ideas that already exist and letting them rub up against each other until they spark and melt into a new idea. You never know quite how it'll happen, but there are basically three key ingredients to facilitate coming up with ideas to developing a creative mindset. I'll teach them to you now. First, you need raw materials. You need to regularly fill your well with images, ideas, experiences, and let them accumulate in the giant warehouse of your mind. You need to watch movies, listen to music, read books and newspapers, talk to people about their ideas and experiences, and just be a huge sponge. You should avoid too much prejudice and be as open-minded as you can. Listen to medieval music, Brazilian music, your grandmother's Broadway show tune LPs, deep cuts of obscure hip-hop albums, anything and everything. You should watch Korean soap operas, films noir, documentaries on fashion designers, and random YouTube tutorials. Absorb as much as you can, but don't be mindless about it. Don't just flip and skip through stuff. Think about it. Talk about it. Read about it. Look for connections, contrasts, and what inspired the people who inspire you. There's an endless web of links and connections between creative ideas, and following the paths will spark new things in you. Let this process of filling your well become a lifetime habit. You're never too old to learn new stuff. Now, I know that schools teach kids lots of stuff, but that's not quite the same as teaching them how to fill their personal well to understand the importance of diverse, seemingly disconnected learning and experience to embracing the obscure and different, the weird and wild, to encouraging and championing this search and making it a vital part of every kid's education. Every kid should feel comfortable eating sushi, listening to Brahms or square dancing. Kids today are more open-minded and tolerant than any generation, and that bodes incredibly well for the future of creativity. I'm just not sure how much that's apparent to the Board of Ed. Step two, let all that stuff sit in the pot. Let it bubble and combine. Let the seeds germinate. Learn to let go. Let the ideas connect behind the scenes. It may take one night. It may take many months. Learn how to quiet your mind, how to distract your inner critic from ripping the cake out of the oven before it's baked. This is a skill too, and it needs to be taught and learned, tried and tested. Your teacher should encourage you to let your mind chill while you doodle and stare out the window, just like your football coach encourages you to get a good night's sleep before the big game. Then, let the ideas pour out of the stew pot. Good, bad, indifferent. Some will drop in your lap, perfect and ready to go. Most will be malformed or covered with an ugly crust or glued to a dozen dud ideas. Which brings us to the final step. In the third phase, you polish your diamonds in the rough. But you need to learn the skills that really make them gleam. You need to learn to edit. To let go of stuff that's obscuring your real idea. You need to learn the process of critique, to sharing constructive criticism that makes others' ideas better, and to accept critiques without feeling slighted. You need to learn how to deal with your ego in the process, and you need to meet people who can help you to make your ideas better. How do you present your ideas? How do you identify the best people to work with? How do you learn from them? Those three steps are the basics of the creative process. Load up with raw materials, 
let your ideas incubate, and then select Edit and Polish. Ready, fire, aim. Of course, easier said than done. You need opportunities to really learn and live this process, to delve into each step, to have mentors and colleagues and safe places to try and fail. Again, I'm not a school teacher, and it's quite possible that much what I'm proposing is already part of many schools' curricula in one way or another. But I was never taught to embrace imagination and problem-solving in school. I never saw my son bringing home idea-generating homework assignments. And even though I spent time in so many wonderful schools, I still felt like creative careers were deemed super risky, and for a small minority of select students... Even though there's an obvious demand from the outside world and the job market for more creative thinkers. So I'll ask again should schools make creativity a focused part of the core curriculum? Not just an elective or an after school club, but a central part of what every child is expected to learn. Should creativity be considered an essential skill rather than a God given talent? or the domain of a fringe group of hipsters and artists? Should schools work to make sure that kids learn the history of creative thinkers, study their processes, learn from the greats? Could we, should we expect kids to be free thinkers, imagineers, innovators, mavericks? And if art seems such a pointless waste to those with the dollars, then fine, let's be creative about it instead of embattled. Should art teachers apply their creative skills not to just getting small handfuls of kids into art school, but to securing a real seat at the table by proving that creative skills matter to every kid's future and that they can be taught it just like trigonometry and French and off-tackle running plays. Let me tell you again something I said at the start of this episode. And let's see if it has more meaning to you now. At Sketchbook School, we don't just teach people to draw and paint. We teach them how to be creative, to think in new and different ways, to have confidence in their creative abilities, to see like artists, to support other creative people in a sprawling community of artists, not just to draw, but to love to draw, to change their lives. It happens every day. It's happened to tens of thousands of folks all over the world. We teach art by asking artists to teach it, and different artists every week. A different experience, a different way of seeing. If this sort of experience sounds intriguing, please take a free sample course. You can sign it at our website, sketchbook.school. We'd love to have you join our community and share your own ideas with us. Thanks for joining me again for Art for All. As always, I'd love to hear from you about your reaction to this podcast. Am I off base, ill-informed, a jerk? Just email me at danny at sketchbookschool.com and let me know. And if you like what I have to say, please leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. It's very helpful. If you don't like it, well, maybe just email me and tell me how I could do it better. Till next time, this is Art for All, and I'm your loyal mudslinger, Danny Gregory. Bye-bye.